Perfect Days is the film by Wim Wenders that depicts a Japanese toilet cleaner. And it's an incredible movie. It's wonderfully meditative and wise. And in this short video, I would like to attempt a brief philosophical analysis of this film. In fact, the first thing that came to mind for me was a quote from Schopenhauer, where he writes, each and every day represents a little birth. And every day, a new youth, every evening, a new coming of age, and every sleep, a little death. And that might as well be the argument of this film, that every day is a little birth. Every day is an opportunity to experience joy. And that, in a sense, every time you go to sleep, it is also a little death. It's about eternal recurrence, as it were, how each and every day represents an opportunity to live a full and rich existence. And yet, there's a certain irony, but perhaps a philosophically poignant one, that the character who is the hero of the story is not a hero in any traditional sense of the word. Instead, he is a mere, supposedly mere, toilet cleaner. And yet, there's something very noble indeed in the manner in which he does this lowest of work. The way in which he commits himself completely to doing something that goes unappreciated by others, and that nevertheless facilitates one of the key participatory mechanisms of public life namely access to a bathroom. Therefore, there is something saint-like, indeed monk-like, about his habits, about his attention to detail, and the manner in which he works in a way that makes him invisible. People don't even see him or recognize him. In fact, one of the key recurring sequences in this film is that he sees a homeless person who appears to be stuck in a fantasy world of his own creation. He's essentially a schizophrenic. And one imagines that the toilet cleaner looking at him sees a sense of recollection. In fact, he smiles to himself. There's a kinship between the two men who somehow stand outside of social life. They are both seen and yet ignored. They are there, but also not. In fact, the film makes the argument through the character's dialogue later that people exist in different worlds, that even though we live in one world, there can be different spheres of participation and existence. On the one hand, this is a reflection on class differences. The character has a wealthy sister, but it's also a reflection on the fact that we create a reality of our own making, that we can choose to be happy, that we can choose to be fulfilled, as it were. Now, this movie also reflects on the minimalism of participating in analog culture. In other words, we have a frequent focus on the joy of listening with attention to music on cassettes instead of streaming it on Spotify. There's also an emphasis on the joy of discovering books and reading them, on the physical quality that comes with these objects, which is therefore uh, a form of love, if you will, how we are able to focus on things that therefore become a meaningful part of our lives. In fact, there's something very spiritual about the way in which the characters depicted not only cleansing himself at the onsen public bath after working in the public toilets, but also the way in which he meticulously takes care of his own living space, how he cleans the floors, how he sprays the little plants in the morning. Essentially, he lives a perfect life, a life of perfect habit and repetition. Once again, there is something monk-like or saint-like about his existence. Which is not to say that his life is perfect. Instead, in some ways, he is indeed a failure. He is not able to confront his father who is in the hospital, who is ailing. He is not able to solve other people's problems or save them from death. He's not able to find a partner or a meaningful relationship himself. He exists outside of life, in his own little world. He is a spectator. He is almost a kind of flaneur, which is to say that he goes through life seeing others and he himself simply is passing through. And there's something very beautiful and meditative about how public life is constantly taking place around this character. The public toilets and the remarkable architecture of these toilets that were commissioned for the Olympics therefore stand as a kind of temple. There's a certain irony to the way in which Wim Wenders films the public toilet as a sacred site. And there are certain sequences in the movie in which he goes from the public toilet to an actual temple. Which isn't to say that Wim Wenders is trying to suggest that toilets are like temples, but he is trying to suggest that the manner in which we pay attention to the things around us, to the things that we might take for granted, and the energy that we invest within our work and our life takes on a kind of spiritual energy as well. And one of the things that I really loved about this movie was that it didn't suggest that analog culture is somehow better than contemporary digital media. It wasn't trying to send a message about that, I think. One of the key sequences is when his niece sits with him 
and he takes out a camera and she has her phone and they both take a picture of the tree above them. This means that one of them is using digital technology and the other one an older technology. And fundamentally, these are both means of access to experiencing the world around you in a more deep way. It's like when you write it down in your journal, it's not that you've necessarily recorded anything meaningful, it's that you've paid attention to your surroundings and therefore feel more present in the moment. Indeed, he is confounded when he, she then takes out a camera, which he gifted her. Her sensibility for photography is therefore being nurtured by him in a way that he didn't even realize. And one of the most philosophical moments in this movie is when they're bicycling over a bridge and the niece says that she would like to go to the beach and he says that's for next time. Essentially what he's arguing is that now is now and next time is next time. This becomes a mantra, a slogan that they say to each other over and over again. It's about being in the present, it's about, it's about appreciating the present moment as it were. But fundamentally this also means that this character exists outside of time. It means that his life becomes a repetitive blur. He does each and everything over and over again. You could say that this is a movie about the surplus enjoyment of habit, of repetitive actions. There's nothing remarkable or heroic about what he's do, about what he is doing, save, the, save for the persistence with which he does it. And surplus enjoyment is a psychoanalytic concept that talks about the enjoyment that we experience above and beyond the mere consumption of a thing. Instead, we can derive surplus enjoyment from a habit. We can derive surplus enjoyment from attention to detail. It's like in the same way how within the Christian faith, but also within the Buddhist lens, attention to detail is a form of love and therefore a form of grace. The manner in which we therefore cultivate our environments reflects back onto ourselves. This means that one of the most profound moments in this movie is precisely when the character is simply reading, when he's simply taking in a book or ideas. This is because everything slows down. The passage of time in this movie is wonderfully depicted. It's like we go through each and every day with the character and this slows down the film and brings us into the frame, into the space of the film, as if we too were experiencing the day-to-day -day motions of this habit. It becomes a very soothing movie indeed. It's similar to Hayao Miyazaki's use of time in his own movies, which he depicts as realist. Namely, often the characters are sitting doing nothing against a supposedly neutral backdrop or against a backdrop filled with the motion of others. And once again, we see how the toilet cleaner is himself in his own world. He's watching the world go by around him. And therefore, on the one hand, he is a heroic figure. You could say that this is an epic movie of very small proportions. But at the same time, one wonders if perhaps he is lacking the courage to participate in social life as such. We don't know anything about his background. Has he been hurt? Does he suffer? Is there something that he cannot forget or cannot forego? This means that fundamentally the movie is not sentimental, but there is a certain melancholy to the manner in which he commits himself to the futile task of doing something which will go unrecognized by others. Indeed, in a key sequence, he encounters his sister, who is much more rich than he is, at least when it comes to monetary terms, and she essentially tries to not look down upon him, and he hugs her, and we see him crying afterwards. Perhaps this is the crying of the failed communication of two worlds that simply cannot reach each other anymore. Therefore, this is a movie that on the one hand posits the idea of spiritual enlightenment through repetitive acts of commitment and through attention to detail and grace. But at the same time, I would say that the movie contains an undertone of the human existential experience, which is that no matter what world we live in, we end up feeling lost. We end up feeling like it's not enough. Each and every day, all we can do is try over and over again. This means that fundamentally, this is a film about what Lacan called the symptom. The symptom is that which you are bound to do each and every day. It's like Sisyphus pushing that boulder up the hill, doomed and fated to do it over and over again, and yet somehow happy. Our symptom is that thing which we carry with us, which we cannot overcome. And fundamentally, happiness therefore comes when we identify with our symptom, when we embrace it. In fact, the movie ends on an optimistic note when the character riding into the sunset like a hero in a Western essentially contemplates the futility of existence, but also the joy and childlike happiness that can come with the realization that every day is indeed in some way perfect. That is Perfect Days by Vim Vendors. Please don't forget to become a patron.